Good morning and welcome to worship for Sunday the 1st of August. I know that many of you will be wanting to know what will be happening in church as Scottish Government relaxes the regulations. We're doing our best to keep up to date but things are moving quite quickly. Every time the regulations change we are required to do new risk assessments at the church, to review and approve them and very often get permission from the presbytery to implement them before we can actually make any changes. I'm very grateful that our office bearers have taken a careful and measured approach. We're moving slowly, perhaps more slowly than some other congregations, but we are moving. We're currently looking at how we can accommodate more people in the church Sunday by Sunday, and hope that soon we'll be off, able to offer spaces to more than 17 households. Once that is clearer, I will update you again. Every Sunday now, members of our congregation are able to gather in the church, but that's still not possible for everyone, for all kinds of reasons. But be assured that wherever you are sharing this service, however you're sharing it, you are very much part of God's beloved family. Jesus said, where two or three gather in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Wherever you are today, as you worship God, may you know yourself to be in the very presence of Christ. Let's worship as we join the hymn, The Church's One Foundation is Jesus Christ our Lord.
Let us pray. Eternal God, maker of the world and all that is in it, we come now to worship you, seeking to recognise and understand the immensity of your power and of your love for us. It's hard for us to truly understand how great you are because we are limited by our own experiences of life, our own understanding of the world and our pride which can lead us to believe that we're more in control than we truly are. Help us on this Sabbath day to stop a moment and just sit still. To think of how far the sky is beyond our reach. How distant the sun and the moon and the stars. How far the seas stretch beyond the horizon. To marvel at the things we cannot understand, how the seas turn, seasons turn from one to another, the marvel of birth, the inexplicable miracles of medicine and science and faith. Help us to reconcile that which we cannot understand with our belief in your Son, Jesus Christ, who was born to live like us and among us, to die for our forgiveness and to rise to demonstrate the gift of eternal life, which is freely offered to us. O oh Lord, when we think of all that is ours in faith, it can be easy to stand in awe and worship. And then, O oh God, we become tied up in our own small world again, in selfishness and pride, in greed and anger, in a lack of humility, and independence at all cost. We ask your forgiveness, O Lord, and the courage to claim it just as it's offered. May this time of worship feed our souls and nourish us for the days that lie before us. We make this and all our prayers as we share together in the prayer your Son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Listen now to the word of God. Hear the word of God, firstly from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 4, reading verses 1 to 16. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. That is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean, except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching, and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, 
speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. The second reading is from John's Gospel, chapter 6, reading verses 24 to 35. Once the crowd realised that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For in him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, What must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, What sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Amen. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Speak to us, O God, through the silence of our surroundings or the noise of life. Through the vacuum we may feel surrounds us or the clamour. Speak and help us to hear and to understand and understanding to claim your word as our own. Amen. The crowds were asking Jesus, how did you do that? They wanted to know because they'd misunderstood what had happened. They thought it was magical. It wasn't magic. It was simply Jesus putting into use the gifts that God had given him. And those gifts weren't given so that he could feed starving people, good as that was, but so that they might come to realise that what they really needed wasn't bread and fish, but the deep spiritual nourishment that he alone could give. But they weren't ready to listen to Jesus' teaching. They didn't understand when he spoke for the first time the words, I am the bread of life. It's easy for us with hindsight to declare, why couldn't they see what he meant? It's easy, isn't it? Jesus can meet our spiritual needs. But it wasn't that straightforward then. And if we're honest, it's not that straightforward for us now, is it? It's always interesting to compare Jesus' teaching with what followed. And we have the ideal opportunity this morning when we look at Ephesians 4. Because here was Paul, not so many years after Jesus' death, trying to encourage the young Christians at Ephesus what it meant to accept Jesus as the bread of life. And Paul's first step was to draw people back into thinking where their roots as Christians lay. He reminds them of where they began, their calling as Christians. The vocation of which Paul speaks is not the call to employment, to a means of service or livelihood as we often understand it, but the pure call of God to proclaim Christ as Lord of our life and live out our life in obedience. Paul says to his listeners, remember that that's what this is all about. Your spiritual nourishment and well-being come only from continually recognising that Christ is central to everything. Then Paul goes on to talk about the unity of the church, reminding his listeners that whatever their individual experiences of God are, they hold something in common with all believers. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God. The early church was an amalgam of different people, different languages, holding different and sometimes even opposing life views, drawn together by faith in Christ. When you think of it, it's really amazing what God managed to do in drawing such disparate views and practices together and building the church into the power it became. But in human terms, it could only do that because the early Christians understood that it wasn't their divisions that kept them apart but their common heritage that glued them together. Next, Paul talks about the gifts that have been given to members of the church and the purpose of those gifts. You can imagine those men and women, can't you, who have gathered to hear Paul. They're really enthusiastic about their faith. They're anxious to get it right They want to be effective in teaching others about Jesus, but they're not sure that they are going about it the right way. And I suspect that Paul's words, while encouraging in large measure, must also have left quite a number of them feeling a bit inadequate or useless as followers. And the reason that probably happened is that Paul focused not on what each of them would bring to the church, 
but what a small number of them would bring as apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers. Perhaps that's a rather exclusive way of looking at the church, in which only a very small number have a meaningful role. I don't think that's true. When you look at it, the role of these people was only there to facilitate the growth of their fellow Christians. It wasn't about lording it over them. They were called to minister in order that the bread of heaven could be recognised for what it is and used to feed hungry and needy souls. And then Paul says it's time to grow up. He was encouraging people to think of the church as a body in which they had their place and that their place was crucial to the whole. But in taking their proper place, they were to understand that the whole point of the church wasn't to place one or two people on pedestals as all powerful or deeply spiritual or wise beyond measure. The whole purpose of the church then, as now, was to be Christ's body on earth. For me, Paul's teaching rings so many bells. It's important to remind ourselves of where we began. Our society is often gripped by a need to delve into our family history and understand a bit more about where we've come from. One of the important elements of being a Christian is that although the family tree goes back for generations... It may include blood relatives and people we never dreamt of, let alone met. But in reality, our individual heritage as Christians goes back only to that time when we allowed God to become relevant in our life. It's our individual response to God that matters, not the principle of following the herd. In 1979, I spent a week at Scottish Church's house in Dunblane. During one of the worship sessions, I heard a Christian song, the words of which have never left me. They were very simple. They began, something happened to my life the day I met my Lord. For me then, they encompassed what being a Christian meant. And that has never left me. I can't tell you when I became a Christian because I can't remember a time when God was not present in my life. When Christ was not real to me. As a three-year-old, I told my mother I was going to be a missionary. But I can tell you that I know that my awareness of God's presence in my life has been a source of strength a spur to action, and sometimes a reprimand. Some people can tell you the exact moment they became a Christian. Others will tell you they can see God's hand directing them over a long period. As we think of our individual experiences of encountering God, Paul's demand for unity becomes very understandable. For your experience of God's calling and mine, or your neighbours, can be very different. It might be a gentle whisper or a loud noise. It might be a calm experience or a storm. It doesn't matter because God speaks in words and ways that you and I can understand and respond to. And he speaks to us as individuals. He knows us, he loves us, he made us, and he didn't make us identical. It's easy sometimes to think that our experience of God is the right one, or the only way, because it's worked, hasn't it, for us? How could anyone who hasn't experienced the same possibly know how, uh, possibly claim to know Christ? And yet, our own individual experiences 
of what matter because that's how God works. The demand he makes of us is to remember that we're individuals, to proclaim one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God over all, and to respect the right of others to acknowledge their call to faith, even if it doesn't mirror ours. The purpose of the church now, as in first century Ephesus, was to be the body of Christ on earth. Have we got the courage now to allow his love to flow through us, even when we may want to retaliate or react to the way that the world taunts us? Have we grown tall enough to raise Christ above the crowds? Have we got the stamina to hold him firm in the face of all that society throws at us? Are we strong enough to support our head and bear him with us? Let us pray. Glory to the Father, to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be world without end. Amen. As we accept the gift of faith that Christ offers us, we're asked to make the same faith available to others through our personal witness, through our serving and our giving of everything that we have. We reflect on that now in our time for giving. As we come to God in prayer now, we remember that every prayer we offer is part of our giving to God. Let us pray. Creator God, we come with hands holding money and possessions. With lives full of moments. With hearts with the capacity to give and receive love. Help us to understand that these bounties are given by you freely and generously. As we offer back to you what we're willing to give, make us as generous, trusting that you will give us everything we need so we can dare to hand over what we have. Take these moments, O God, as we pause before you and dare to ask of you. Grant us the confidence to trust that you will not only hear us, but respond to our asking. Lord, we often find it easy to ask for others, to remember the big things in life. Yet so often the things that drag us down are the small things, the things we feel we can't bother you with, the things we feel are so insignificant in the scheme of things that we keep them to ourselves. So today, God, we think of those insignificant things. The wee things that worry us. The words or actions that have hurt us. The fears we try to hide. the people that matter most to us. Whatever lies heavy on our hearts or demands our attention causes us sleepless nights or pain. We bring them to you now in silence.
O bread of life, we can ask anything of you for ourselves and for others. And we do so now as we cast our minds across our community, our workplace, our family life. We bring to you the news items that have excited us or caused us concern this week. The situations around the world where your response is desperately needed. And we pray your kingdom will come, O Lord. Your will be done. O bread of life who has given us all that we need and more besides for our daily living. Fill us with a sense of your presence, that as we step out of this time of worship, we may do so confident that we're not alone, and that you provide not only for our material needs, but for every aspect of our living and breathing. Amen. Our closing hymn today is the hymn Here in This Place. We may not all be back gathered in one physical space, but God holds our souls and draws us together through his Holy Spirit. May you have bread on the table and peace in your hearts, joy for today and hope for tomorrow. 
And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, rest upon and remain with you today and always. Amen. Thank you.